I'll be with you in the sunrise. I'll be with you when the shadows fall. In your dreams, in your wakefulness, I'll be with you always. I'll be with you in the sunrise. I'll be with you when the shadows fall. In your dreams, in your wakefulness, I'll be with you always. I'll be with you in the sunrise. I'll be with you when the shadows fall. In your dreams, in your wakefulness, I'll be with you Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton's online Zoom service. I am Karen Belita. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I serve the Unitarian Church of Edmonton as the president of the Board of Trustees. We are a liberal, multi-generational religious community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity including diversity of beliefs, from divine believers to humanists, from pagans to atheists and agnostics. We believe in the compassion of the human heart, the warmth of community, the pursuit of justice, and the search of meaning in our lives. Whether you've been part of our congregation for decades, or this is your first time visiting, we welcome you. Whatever the faith and traditions of your past, we welcome you. Whatever your theological stance, we welcome you. Whatever your heritage, we welcome you. Whoever you are and whomever you love, we welcome you, the whole of you. We especially welcome any visitors who might be with us today. We invite you to go place your name and contact information in our online guest book, which you can find on the uce.ca website. I welcome everyone to join us after the service in a special community conversation in regards to the future of the direction of UCE. The conversation will begin right after our announcements. We acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, home of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people over many centuries. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. We begin today in sharing Edmonton's 12 redrawn municipal wards with you. The names were chosen by a panel of 17 Indigenous women, the Committee of Indigenous Matriarchs, and the names were approved by the City Council in December. Today we share with you Ward 2. The Anilnook Ward is in Northwest Edmonton. It is an Inuit word that means breath of life or spirit. This choice reminds us of the many Inuit who were treated for tuberculosis in the Charles Cancel Indian Hospital in Edmonton, and that despite their treatment, many died. Good morning, I am Reverend Leanne Washington and I'm the Interim Minister for the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. This month, our theme is commitment. In honor of International Women's Day, I will introduce you to an ancient and poetic ode to a woman whose commitment to her family and community is well worth emulating. 
In Hebrew, she is called Eshet Chayil, which is commonly translated as a woman, Eshet, of valor, Chayil, or as a woman of virtue, or as a wife of virtue. She's commonly referred to also as the Proverbs 31 woman because that's the book and chapter of the Hebrew scriptures where she's found. Some of you may already be familiar with the Proverbs 31 woman. If you were raised in either a Christian or Jewish religious tradition, you probably heard all about the virtuous woman once a year, typically on Mother's Day. Even if you were not raised in one of these traditions, you may have seen the poem framed and hanging on a wall or a shortened version of it embroidered on a pillow or a throw quilt. Whether or not you are familiar with the poem, many of you have some sense of how women were treated in biblical times. I'd like for you to take a moment and write in the chat window, which likely appears on the bottom or the side of your screen, what impression you have about how women were treated during biblical times. So take a moment now, think about it, and share your thoughts in the chat window. I'd like to read a few of them. Maria says, defined only by her husband and who her sons are. Coralie says, as the property of men. Lynn says, as adjacent, as secondary. And all of those impressions are grounded in some stories in the Bible. However, today we're going to explore an ancient, uh, an ancient portrayal of woman or womanhood that doesn't fit any of those commonly understood ways in which women were treated in the Bible and what was expected of them. Anissa Nanduala, a spoken word poet of color, tells us that gender is a pre-written book and encourages us to choose to challenge and write our own stories. Please listen. Gender is a pre-written book. And the plot is boring. Daughter, girlfriend, mother, wife, rip out the pages, staple them to your back and start soaring. Pretty, quiet, weak. They will try to describe you with such things, but you will use their stereotypes and turn them into your wings when you choose to challenge. Gender is a pre-written book, but not all the girls' stories end the same way. 33,000 girls are forced to become child brides every day. 132 million girls are not in school. And their futures are balloons that they watch drift away. But you, are the full stop to the story you are the new sentence that takes it on a different road when you speak up you open your palms and you share the load when you choose to challenge gender is a pre-written book but not all of the characters are included like the first nations women who stand as still as statues always walked past but never acknowledged or seen, or migrant women whose culture stands like, it's, like a skyscraper 
and they're forced to burn down the parts of themselves society doesn't deem convenient or refugee women who are treated with brutality when we should have been lenient. And you are there as this story unfolds and you are faced with a choice. So choose to challenge. Gender is a pre-written book. And this is your chance to add your own chapter, to call out racism and sexism and use courage to rub it out, to stand where the rest of the world has chosen to sit, to call it out at home, at work, at school, bit by bit, to scream where the world has chosen to whisper, not just for your daughter, your mother or your sister, let us choose to challenge. Gender is a pre-written book. And if you're listening to this, then your actions are the pen. Your life is the paper. You are not the oppression of the past. I believe that you are so much greater, stronger, kinder, Choose to create history, not to be created by it. Choose to challenge. Today I'm accepting Anissa Nandoala's summons to choose to challenge by sharing with you this ancient portrait of womanhood through poetry, song, and image. By doing so, I hope to begin busting the myth that women in the ancient world were treated as chattel, as secondary, as only having the status of their husbands or their sons, or didn't have personal agency, or were any way valued less than their husbands or considered less capable than. As we We light this chalice to honor the memory of those who have come before us kindling flames of wisdom in dark times, willing to challenge orthodoxy even at great personal risk, giving us a legacy of freedom and a love of truth, a legacy that warms our hearts and lights our path. With mics muted, please join in singing hymn number 212, We Are Dancing Sarah's Circle. We are dancing, Sarah's circle. We are dancing, Sarah's circle. We. 
part of our community is sharing the joys and sorrows of our lives. If you have a personally significant joy or sorrow, please type it into the chat window at the bottom or the side of your screen where you will be able to see it and we will be able to see it. I will read them aloud. Your joys and sorrows will be part of our posted recording of the service. If you would not like to have your joy or sorrow available to the public, then indicate that in the chat with the prefix private and then add your joy or sorrow. You may also send your joy or sorrow to candles at uce.ca. While you compose your joys and sorrows, please take a moment to reflect upon the joys and sorrows in the life of our community at UCE and in Edmonton while enjoying Mist of Cape Britain performed by Gordon Ritchie. celebration, wishing happy birthday to Jan McMillan, a wonderful friend to many, many of us. Susan lights a candle of support for Edmonton women wearing hijab who are being attacked in our streets. Yvonne lights a candle of condolence and concern for her friend Helen who's recovering from a head injury and her father who is dying. Art lights a celebratory candle, happy birthday to his number one great grand, his great daughter, Princess Ella. Um, Maureen lights a candle for Jolien, whose mother passed away on Thursday. Audrey lights a candle of celebration for the courage of all who have dealt with a whole year of this pandemic and still come together here to love and support each other in respect for the diversity among us. Lynn lights a candle of sorrow for the late Jamil French, a young actor she knew when he was a child living near her mother in Toronto. Jan lights a candle. <laughs> I believe this must be a candle of celebration 
uh, because her daughter, Kathy, finally gave in and the family now has a new puppy. Yvonne lights a candle of concern for her sister, Amy, who's been diagnosed with cancer this week. Ruth Hill lights a candle for International Women's Day tomorrow on March 8th. Now I light one candle for all the unspoken joys and sorrows held within the sanctuary of our hearts and also for all those who have yet to find a spiritual home where they can share their joys and sorrows. Now that we have lit our candles of connection, I invite you to enjoy a moment of reflection as you listen to an instrumental version of Eshet Hayil performed at a Jewish wedding by Israel Gatterer and Shmuel Levinson. written in honor of International Women's Day, written by Ms. Moen. Today is a celebration for women all around the world. Women who dared to dream big ever since they were little girls for the diversity and talents that lie within the human heart, for the courage and determination that prevents us falling apart. We can raise families and build businesses and be proud of all we've achieved. Where once over visions of that scale could never have been believed. Women, stand up and be counted. Smile at how far we have come and cherish every single day as daughter, as wife, companion, or mom. Don't let anyone, anybody tell you that there are set paths for you to follow. As a little girl with a passion is an inspiring woman of tomorrow. So celebrate all women and acknowledge the great things they do and tell a woman close to your heart just how much she means to you. 
With mics muted, please join in singing hymn number 1019, Everything Possible. We've cleared off the table, left over safe, washed the dishes and put them away. I've told you a story, talked you in time, at the end of your milk about day. As the moon sets in sails to carry you to sleep, over the identity. Realizing that we have, by and large, moved beyond such limiting notions, I ask you not to let your rejection of traditional gender roles or rejection of the Bible obscure this morning's message or the wisdom that lies within the text. This is one of those moments when we Unitarian Universalists must be gentle with the text, recognizing that its context is not our own. I refer to what you will hear as a poem because it is written in Hebrew as an acrostic poem. That is, each line of each verse begins with a letter of the alphabet in their proper order. The first verse begins with Aleph, Hebrew for A, and the second verse begins with Bet, Hebrew for B, and so on and so forth. You will not hear rhyming words, but you will hear words that paint many different images of ancient womanhood. 
Now, John Sproul will read for us Eshet Chayil from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which is the preferred Bible translation for many liberal and progressive Christians. Having said that, every translation is interpretation, and I find even this one wanting from the viewpoint of biblical scholarship. You'll hear more about that in my message. In the meantime, you may want to close your eyes, enjoy the word pictures, and create your own images as John reads for us. A capable wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid for her household when it snows for all her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchant with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy. Her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the city gates. As you know, Jews observe a Sabbath or day of rest from Friday night at sundown to Saturday night at sundown. In traditional Jewish homes, women prepare a formal dinner in anticipation of the Sabbath, while men gather at the synagogue or temple for a short worship service welcoming the Sabbath. Then the men return home to their families and enjoy a family meal, sometimes including guests. Whether or not there are guests at the table, the meal does not begin until the parents bless their children, if they have any, and the husband sings Eshet Chayil a cappella to his wife, whether he can do it on key or not. Please enjoy a group of young Jewish men practicing the traditional tune for Eshet Chayil in Hebrew. Eshet Chayil Mimza Verahok me pini mimikra Batah bale bala Veshana lelo yerza Malatu dole oma Kole yerza Darshan. Thank you. 
now in anticipation that our service this morning is likely to continue for more than the usual 60 minutes. We hope that you will be able to stay with us, but if you need to leave, we certainly understand. You know, tomorrow is International Women's Day, and on that day, many governmental entities, nonprofit organizations, and educational institutions recognize the vital role of women in society. So I think it's appropriate to spend this Sunday exploring one of the most comprehensive images of womanhood in the Bible, Proverbs 31, Eshet Chayil. The poem, the poem comes at the end of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is thought to be the oldest existing example of the Hebrew wisdom movement, whose founding is commonly attributed to King Saul, Solomon. Though scholars differ as to when Proverbs was written, a commonly accepted date is 1000 BCE, which would make it about 3000 years old. The wisdom tradition was developed by the professional sages or wise men and scribes in the service of the court and consisted primarily in the maxims about the practical, intelligent way to conduct one's life and in speculations about the very worth and meaning of human life. Proverbs is a book of wisdom sayings and moral instructions directed toward a group of young men who are expected to become the social and political leaders of their people. While everyone can find pearls of wisdom in Proverbs, you can tell from the language that the entire book was written assuming that it would be read by those young men and probably only those young men. So you may be asking yourself, what could a poem about a woman written almost 3000 years ago have to say that would be remotely relevant to or applicable to women today? Well, I'll tell you. I grew up in a traditional household where my mother's place was primarily in the home, taking care of her children and her husband. My father's place was primarily outside the home, earning a living and participating in civil, civic affairs. As a young woman eager to leave the nest and find my place in the world, I had a hard time finding female role models that did not conform to my mother's paradigm of womanhood. All the books, magazines, news articles, and radio talk shows at the time emphasized how difficult if not impossible, it was for a woman to be a devoted and loving spouse and parent while also actively participating in the world beyond the home. As a teenager in Sunday school, I was rarely taught about Bible stories where women were the main character. 
And on those rare occasions when I was, the emphasis was always on their roles as good wives and mothers, never astute businesswomen or scholars or political leaders. Imagine my surprise when I first met Proverbs 31 woman as an adult student of biblical literature. The poem spoke to me over the millennia and gave me permission to be all the things I wanted to be, a partner, a mother, a teacher, a lawyer, and now a pastor. Let's take a look at the poem and you'll see what I mean. A good wife, Eshet Chayil, who can find? She's far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. The phrase Eshet Chayil has often been translated by Bible translators with an emphasis on the role of wife, including capable wife, wife of noble character, perfect wife, excellent wife, and wife with a strong character. The English translation of eshet is straightforward. It means woman in general, not wife or mother or maidservant, but woman, every woman or any woman. Woman without regard to any limiting role or status. Hebrew has another word which has meant wife, isha. Adam is ish and Eve is Isha. While becoming a wife was normative in those days, just as it remains today, I contend that the translators have done us a disservice by imposing the role or status of wife onto Eshet Chayil, as though all women aren't able to embrace the characteristics of an Eshet Chayil. I submit that the translations in which Eshet becomes wife are imposing onto the text the gender and social location of the translators, who are mostly accomplished white male biblical scholars. In the context of this poem, the meaning of chayil is not so straightforward. In Hebrew, chayil is a masculine noun, most commonly used in association with describing some positive characteristics of men in leadership positions such as a man of valor, a man of courage, a man of wealth. In this case, valor is the English translation for chayil. One of the challenges of translating ancient languages is that they are compact. That is, one biblical Hebrew word may have several nuanced meanings depending on the context. So one biblical Hebrew word may legitimately be translated by several different but related English words. Sometimes insisting on one English word as the equivalent for one Hebrew word fails to capture the full meaning of the Hebrew word in context. According to the Hebrew dictionary written by Messrs. Brown, Driver, and Briggs, chayil may mean strength, efficiency, wealth, valor, and moral worth. So with regard to Eshet Chayil, I submit that the best translation is a powerful, capable, wise and wealthy woman. And I support my expanded translation by referring to the stanzas of the poem itself. Here she seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and tasks her maidens. Here we find the depiction of an industrious woman not afraid of doing whatever needs to be done. She leads by example. She doesn't demand that her staff do anything that she herself is not willing to do. And apparently she lives by the old adage, early to bed and early to rise makes a woman healthy, wealthy, and wise. Now, I have to admit that there is one verse in this poem that gives me pause. I don't know what to make of the imagery. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. I invite you to share in the chat box any ideas you have about what this verse is getting at. 
She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds her loins with strength and makes her arms strong. Here, we may understand that Eshet Chayil, without her husband's involvement, assesses the value of a field and purchases it with her own financial resources. Eshet Chayil is wealthy in her own right. Whether inherited wealth or earned wealth, the wealth is hers. And given how industrious she is, we can imagine that whatever financial resources she brought into the marriage, they have increased through her efforts. Here, we also see that Eshechayil is not only well equipped financially, she is also physically strong. She girds her loins and strengthens her arms. From this, we may understand that she intentionally takes actions that will increase her physical strength. Eshet Chayil works out. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. Eshet Chayil is a successful businesswoman. Some women hear this poem as an indictment against women of all the things that women are supposed to do and that they themselves are not. They hear these verses, especially the part, her lamp does not go out at night, matched with, she puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle as an admonition to never stop working. I have an equally valid and I think more realistic interpretation. I pair, her lamp does not go out at night, with the preceding line, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. And I return to Eshechayil's financial resources. In other words, she's earned enough money that she does not have to worry about her lamp going out at night. She doesn't have to ration lamp oil. It's a statement of luxury and more than enough, rather than an exhortation to never cease working. And having more than enough, she shares what she has with the poor and the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known at the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers, delivers girdles to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. These verses continue in that same vein and show that there are enough financial resources created by Eshet Chayil's efforts that her entire family is protected from the cold. They aren't wearing any old rags. They are wearing some of the rarest and most expensive materials in their day, linen, crimson, and anything colored in purple. Also, she's not relegated to the domestic realm. What she and her staff produce, she, she sells by engaging in commerce with the merchants who will resell her goods to the public. She laughs at the time to come because she and her family are well provisioned. She does not worry. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Here, Eshet Chayil is praised for her wisdom and kindness and good relations with her children and husband who appreciate her. Don't be turned off by the phrase, a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. In its time, the phrase was used to describe all people who respected the wisdom teachings thought to have originated with God. Fear, in this case, doesn't mean motivated by actual fear, but rather motivated by respect. 
usually the result of a person being wise enough to understand the ethical reasoning attributed to God's command and commandments and guidance. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in all the gates. In the United States, all I have to say here is, Lily Ledbetter, anyone? And everyone gets it. Lily Ledbetter's wage discrimination case made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and she lost. Her loss motivated the U.S. Congress to enact the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009 to rectify a loophole in the existing employment laws. Gender-based wage disparities also exist in Canada, however, and according to the Canadian Women's Foundation, Canada is ranked as having the eighth highest gender pay gap out of a list of 43 countries examined by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in 2016. Canada was ranked after the European Union, which is listed as a single country, but includes 28 countries. There are many factors that play into why this is so, including among other things that in our binary world, people working in what have been jobs traditionally associated with women, such as teachers, daycare workers, and nurses are paid less than people working in jobs traditionally associated with men, regardless of gender. Also, more women than men tend to work in part-time positions without any paid benefits. So in order to compare apples to apples, we can compare the annual earnings of full-time workers. On that basis, women workers in Canada earned an average of 75 cents for every dollar earned by men in 2016. Also, on the basis of hourly pay of full-time working women to those of men, women earned an average of 87 cents for every dollar earned by men. This gender pay gap contributes to women's poverty, health concerns, and barriers to leaving abusive relationships. While Canada's provinces have begun to address this, this disparity in income by passing laws that require transparency in salary reporting and publicizing, those efforts are in their infancy and enforcement is sparse. To support these efforts, you may want to participate in a local activity on Saturday, April 4th, which is Equal Pay Day in Canada. Now remember how this poem opens with a rhetorical question? Translation teams almost always composed of male biblical scholars have translated the question this way, a capable wife who can find. Does that sound as insulting to you as it does to me? Doesn't that make it seem like capable wives are hard to find? If that's so, then it must be the case that most wives aren't capable right? Well, once again, I think the translators, not the biblical text, are showing their social location and male privilege. The word that has been translated as find is the Hebrew word yimsa, which comes from the root word matza, whose standard meanings, according to the Hebrew dictionary, are attain or find, which are also related to the English word secure or acquire. Since chapters 1 through 30 of Proverbs were written to certain young men living at the king's court, preparing to be leaders in their respective communities, I contend that Proverbs 31 was also written for them as an incentive to adhere to the admonitions and words of wisdom imparted in chapters 1 through 30. The question is not a capable woman who can find, but rather a powerful, capable, wise and wealthy woman who can attain to or who can secure or acquire. The unspoken answer is only young men who live according to the lessons they learned in the preceding 30 chapters of Proverbs are worthy of such a woman. My translation choice takes away the insult and makes the poem not a depiction of an impossibly ideal woman, as some commentators have suggested, but rather a challenge to young men to live lives that would make them worthy of such a partner. And once having attained such a partner, the ancient Jewish practice of reciting the poem every Friday night would enforce 
or reinforce the young man's understanding and appreciation for all that his partner in life does for him. Care for their children, manage their household, create wealth, invest wisely, teach wisdom, and model compassion and generosity to only name a few things that a woman can do in different seasons of her life. On this point, a modern observant Jewish woman in the Reconstructionist movement has shared her understanding of the poem online. She understands it as being in praise of all the strong, capable, industrious women and wise women in her life, as well as herself. Contemplating the traditional Sabbath custom where her father sang this poem to her mother before Shabbat meal began, she says, I remember well Shabbat evenings around our family table. When it came time for my father to sing Eshet Chayil, my mother, the proud feminist wanted the song, every word of it. She'd worked hard. The bags under her eyes were dark. A three course meal was ready in the kitchen even though she'd only left her office an hour before. She wanted the song. Yes, she knew the words written by men of another time. Eshet Chayil didn't exactly describe her own sense of the way things should be. But it was there, two minutes built into the traditional Friday night ritual that were just for her. Two minutes when she could sit back and close her eyes and feel that all her efforts were appreciated. Yes, 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 she thought, I deserve a song. As is true of many ancient folk songs, Eshet Chayil can be sung with a traditional tune or any number of fresh new tunes. This next tune for Eshet Chayil was first sung by a young Jewish man at a summer camp as they were learning the song so that when the time came, they would be prepared to honor their wives on Friday night. Please enjoy this rendition of Eshet Chayil. Eshet Chayil Mimzad Verachok Mimni Mikra Bata Bale Bala Vishala Long Yechta Gimala
My name is Andrew Mills, and I have been your Canvas Chair for the past 14 years. My volunteer task is to create an estimate of our donation income for the annual church budget. To get that estimate, I'm asking you, our donors, to pledge your financial support to the church. Then at the end of March, I compile the pledges and prepare an income forecast for the annual general meeting. Your pledges directly influence the staffing and program levels in our church, so it's important that everyone submits a pledge. Our theme for this year's Canvas is reemergence. We're inching closer to a time when we'll be able to reemerge from this pandemic, but we've had a few setbacks this year. By not holding services, we've not had any collection plate income. We have also lost rental income as the church building has been closed for many months. So I'm asking you, our donors, to pledge generously for our year of reemergence. Please help us financially to prepare our church for reemergence in the coming year. You can find a link to our electronic pledge form in the monthly newsletter and in the weekly emails during March. Note that if you're having difficulty with the form, you're welcome to phone me or send me an email. You can also find more details about this year's Canvas on the UC webpage. Go to uc.ca and click on the Canvas 2021 Reemergence banner to visit the Canvas website. Thank you to all our donors. I ask you to please return your pledge before the end of March to support the work of our church. Generosity is a spiritual practice, one that enlarges the heart and lightens the spirit. For no matter how much or how little we have, in the sharing of it, both the one who gives and the one who receives are blessed. We are a self-governing and self-supporting community. We rely on your donations to support our staff and to offer our programs. Now more than ever, we need your financial support please visit our website at uce.ca and click on Donate in the upper left corner to find the donation method that best suits you. For the month of March, we encourage you to also support the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists, the ICUU. Please visit their website for more information about them. You'll find a link to the ICUU page on our church homepage at uce.ca. And now with mics muted, please join in singing hymn 402, From You I Receive. going to flip the script and have Coralie Carnes read Proverbs 31 as though the subject of the poem is a man, a husband, a father, and a businessman. Although this poem was written from a binary point of view, which is not challenged by our flipping the script this way, I invite you to see if you agree with me that Proverbs 31 paints a word picture with images that are suitable for anyone along the gender spectrum. That is, the Proverbs 31 person has characteristics that are desirable in all human beings and well worth emulating. Please listen again with a new perspective to Proverbs 31. A capable husband, who can find? He is far more precious than jewels. The heart of his wife trusts in him, and she will have no lack of gain. He does her good and not harm all the days of his life. He seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. He is like the ships of the merchant. He brings his food from far away. He rises while it is still night and provides food for his household and tasks for his servant girls. He considers a field and buys it. With the <clears throat> fruits of his hands, he plants a vineyard. He girds himself with strength and makes his arms strong. He perceives that his merchandise is profitable. He 
His lamp does not go out at night and he puts his hands to the distaff and hands hold the sp spindle. He opens his hands to the poor and reaches out his hand to the needy. He is not afraid for his household when it snows, for all his household are clothed in crimson. He makes himself coverings. His clothing is of fine linen and purple. His wife is known in the city gates, taking her seat among the elders of the land. He makes linen garments and sells them. He supplies the merchant with sashes. Strength and dignity are his clothing, and he laughs at the time to come. He opens his mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on his tongue. He looks well to the ways of his household and does not eat the bread of idleness. His children rise up and call him happy. His wife too, and she praises him. Many men have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a man who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give him a share in the fruit of his hands and let his work praise him in the city gates. As we come toward the close of our service today, I wanna to make sure that we express our gratitude for those who have made this time together possible. Our host and greeter, Jeff Bizantz, our slide creator and runner, Andrew Mills, our readers, Ruth Patrick, John Sproul, and Coralie Carnes, recorder, Ruth Marriott, and our breakout room host, Sylvia Crow. Beginning today, the interim transition team will periodically seek your input by posing a question to you at a Sunday service. The questions and the Sundays on which they will be asked are posted in March's newsletter. If you'd like to answer a question, but will not be able to attend the service on the Sunday on which it will be posted, you may email Ruth Patrick with your answer. Her email may also be found in March's newsletter. Now, Ruth Patrick will pose the question and give you some instructions on what to do. Ruth? Ruth, we can't hear you. I beg your pardon. What do we stand for? This is the question you were asked to ponder for this week. I'm asking you now in, in the chat room, if you could individually respond with a brief message to or five words perhaps if you were one person is doing it for everybody in the chat room please say how many people you're answering for and if you can't figure or find an answer today please feel free to email them to me thank you very much this way we'll know how many responded and where we stand thank you so we're asking you to take this question into a chat room for five minutes, discuss it amongst yourselves, and then when you return to the main room, share your answers in the chat so that we can uh, read a few out loud and save them for the interim transition team to ponder later. I think some of that happened while you were going on. Well, if it is shared in a chat box in a breakout room, we won't have it here. So we're asking everyone to share what we stand for um, in the main room chat box, please. Ah, 
okay. And now we're getting some really nice responses. We stand for respect, honesty, and striving to support and respect all of our people. people. Uh, we stand for a spiritual home, a place to question beliefs and continue learning. Justice and equality, we stand for justice, pluralism, and community, for freedom of opinion, for acceptance of differences. We stand for support for spiritual development of members in the community. We stand for the inherent worth and dignity of everyone within the interdependent web of all existence. Very nice combining some of our principles, the first and seventh to be exact. Um, we stand for equity in all human relationships. We accept different sexual orientations and ethnicities. We don't require conformity. All right, well, thank you and keep putting them in there. I am going to be sharing the chat, uh, not sharing, sorry. I'm going to be saving my chat so that the interim transition team will have an opportunity to review the answers as they go forward in their work. So thank you so much for your responses. Another question will be posed to you on Sunday, March 21st. Now, as we extinguish our chalice, Ruth Patrick will share To Be Strong Enough, written by George G. Davis. Be strong enough to gain some mastery over ourselves and humble enough to be willing to learn from others. Be brave enough to choose the right word, road, no matter how hard it may be, and patient enough to keep on in spite of obstacles. Be wise enough to know our own shortcomings and honest enough to admit the excellence of others. Be proud enough to command the respect of strong individuals and gentle enough to win the love of little children. Be careful enough to protect the good of others and generous enough to share our own. Blessed be. worship service this morning, please feel free to take a short comfort break, get a cup of coffee, and watch our weekly announcements as they slide by. In a few minutes, you'll be invited into randomly assigned breakout rooms for conversation and coffee if you bring a cup, that is. You may accept the invitation to join a breakout room, you may decline the invitation, or you may accept the invitation, and then when you're ready, turn, return to the main room. I will remain in the main room for about an hour for questions about the service and general discussion. <laughs> 